Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Chapter 2 Treats of Oliver Twist's Growth, Education, and Board For the next eight or ten months, Oliver was the victim of a systematic course of treachery and deception. He was brought up by hand. The hungry and destitute situation of the infant orphan was duly reported by the workhouse authorities to the parish authorities. The parish authorities inquired with dignity of the workhouse authorities whether there was no female then domiciled in the house, who was in a situation to impart to Oliver Twist the consolation and nourishment of which he stood in need. The workhouse authorities replied, with humility, that there was not. Upon this, the parish authorities magnanimously and humanely resolved that Oliver should be farmed, or, in other words, that he should be dispatched to a branch workhouse, some three miles off, where twenty or thirty other juvenile offenders against the poor laws rolled about the floor all day, without the inconvenience of too much food, or too much clothing, under the parental superintendence of an elderly female, who received the culprits at and for the consideration of sevenpence halfpenny per small head per week. Sevenpence halfpenny's worth per week is a good round diet for a child. A great deal may be got for sevenpence halfpenny, quite enough to overload its stomach and make it uncomfortable. The elderly female was a woman of wisdom and experience. She knew what was good for children, and she had a very accurate perception of what was good for herself. So, she appropriated the greater part of the weekly stipend to her own use, and consigned the rising parochial generation to even a shorter allowance than was originally provided for them, thereby finding in the lowest depth a deeper still, and proving herself a very great experimental philosopher. Everybody knows the story of another experimental philosopher, who had a great theory about a horse being able to live without eating and who demonstrated it so well that he had got his own horse down to a straw a day, and would unquestionably have rendered him a very spirited and rampacious animal on nothing at all, if he had not died four and twenty hours before he was to have had his first comfortable bait of air. Unfortunately for the experimental philosophy of the female to whose protecting care Oliver Twist was delivered over, a similar result usually attended the operation of her system. For at the very moment when the child had contrived to exist upon the smallest possible portion of the weakest possible food, it did perversely happen in eight and a half cases out of ten, either that it sickened from want and cold, or fell into the fire from neglect, or got half smothered by accident, in any one of which cases the miserable little being was usually summoned into another world and there gathered to the fathers it had never known in this. Occasionally, when there was some more than usually interesting inquest upon a parish child who had been overlooked in turning up a bedstead, or inadvertently scalded to death when there happened to be a washing, though the latter accident was very scarce, anything approaching to a washing being of rare occurrence in the farm, the jury would take it into their heads to ask troublesome questions or the parishioners would rebelliously affix their signatures to a remonstrance. But these impertinences were speedily checked by the evidence of the surgeon and the testimony of the beadle, the former of whom had always opened the body and found nothing inside, which was very probable indeed, and the latter of whom invariably swore whatever the parish wanted, which was very self-devotional. Besides, the board made periodical pilgrimages to the farm and always sent the beadle the day before to say they were going. The children were neat and clean to behold when they went, and what more would the people have? It cannot be expected that this system of farming would produce any very extraordinary or luxuriant crop. Oliver Twist's ninth birthday found him a pale, thin child, somewhat diminutive in stature, and decidedly small in circumference. But nature, or inheritance, had implanted a good, sturdy spirit in Oliver's breast. It had had plenty of room to expand, thanks to the spare diet of the establishment, and perhaps to this circumstance may be attributed his having any ninth birthday at all. 
Be this as it may, however, it was his ninth birthday, and he was keeping it in the coal cellar, with a select party of two other young gentlemen, who, after participating with him in a sound thrashing, had been locked up for atrociously presuming to be hungry, when Mrs. Mann, the good lady of the house, was unexpectedly startled by the apparition of Mr. Bumble, the beadle, striving to undo the wicket of the garden gate. "'Goodness gracious! Is that you, Mr. Bumble, sir?' said Mrs. Mann, thrusting her head out of the window in well-affected ecstasies of joy. "'Susan, take Oliver and them two brats upstairs and wash them directly.' "'Oh, my heart alive, Mr. Bumble! How glad I am to see you, surely!' Now, Mr. Bumble was a fat man, and a choleric, so instead of responding to this open-hearted salutation in a kindred spirit, he gave the little wicket a tremendous shake, and then bestowed upon it a kick, which could have emanated from no leg but a beadle's. "'Law! Only think!' said Mrs. Mann, running out, for the three boys had been removed by this time. "'Only think of that!' "'that I should have forgotten that the gate was bolted on the inside on account of them dear children. Walk in, sir. Walk in, pray, Mr. Bumble, do, sir.' Although this invitation was accompanied with a curtsy that might have softened the heart of a churchwarden, it by no means mollified the beadle. "'Do you think this respectful or proper conduct, Mrs. Mann, inquired Mr. Bumble, grasping his cane, "'to keep the parish officers awaiting at your garden gate, when they come here upon parochial business with the parochial orphans. Are you aware, Mrs. Mann, that you are, as I may say, a parochial delegate and a stipendiary?' Oh, I'm sure, Mr. Bumble. Oh, that I was only a telling one or two of the dear children as is so fond of you that it was you a coming, replied Mrs. Mann with great humility. Mr. Bumble had a great idea of his oratorical powers and his importance. He had displayed the one and vindicated the other. He relaxed. Well, well, Mrs. Mann, he replied in a calmer tone. It may be as you say. It may be. Lead the way in, Mrs. Mann, for I'll come on business and have something to say. Mrs. Mann ushered the beadle into a small parlour with a brick floor, placed a seat for him, and officiously deposited his cocked hat and cane on the table before him. Mr. Bumble wiped from his forehead the perspiration which his walk had engendered, glanced complacently at the cocked hat, and smiled. Yes, he smiled. Beadles are but men, and Mr. Bumble smiled. Now, don't you be offended at what I'm a-going to say, observed Mrs. Mann with captivating sweetness. You've had a long walk, you know, or I would mention it. Now, "'Will you take a little drop of something, Mr. Bumble?' "'Not a drop, nor a drop,' said Mr. Bumble, waving his right hand in a dignified but placid manner. "'I think you will,' said Mrs. Mann, who had noticed the tone of the refusal, and the gesture that had accompanied it. "'Just a little drop, with a little cold water, and a lump of sugar.' <coughs> Mr. Bumble coughed. "'Now, just a little drop,' said Mrs. Mann persuasively. "'What is it?' inquired the beadle. "'Why, it's what I'm obliged to keep a little of in the house, to put into the blessed infant's daffy, when they ain't well, Mr. Bumble,' replied Mrs. Mann, as she opened a corner cupboard and took down a bottle and glass. "'It's gin.' "'I'll not deceive you, Mr. B. It's gin.' "'Do you give the children daffy, Mrs. Mann?' inquired Bumble, following with his eyes the interesting process of mixing. "'Oh, bless em, that I do, dear as it is,' replied the nurse. 
I couldn't see him suffer before my very eyes, you know, sir. No, said Mr. Bumble approvingly. No, you could not. You are a humane woman, Mrs. Mann. Here she set down the glass. I shall take her early opportunity of mentioning it to the board, Mrs. Mann. He drew it towards him. You feel as a mother, Mrs. Mann. He stirred the gin and water. I, I drink to your health with cheerfulness, Mrs. Mann. And he swallowed half of it. And now, about business, said the beadle, taking out a leathern pocket book. The child that was half baptized Oliver Twist is nine year old today. Bless him, interposed Mrs. Mann, inflaming her left eye with the corner of her apron. And notwithstanding, half a reward of ten pounds, which was afterwards increased to twenty pound. Notwithstanding a most superlative, and I may say supernatural, exertions on the part of this parish, said Bumble, we have never been able to discover who is his father, or what was his mother's settlement, name, or condition. Mrs. Mann raised her hands in astonishment, but added, after a moment's reflection, How comes he to have any name at all, then? The beadle drew himself up with great pride, and said, I invented it. You, Mr. Bumble? I, Mrs. Mann. We name our fondlings in alphabetical order. The last was a S, Swabble, I named him. This was a T, Twist, I named him. The next one comes will be Unwin and the next, Vilkins. I have got names ready-made to the end of the alphabet, and all the way through it again, when we come to Z. Why, you're quite a literary character, sir, said Mrs. Mann. Well, well, said the beadle, evidently gratified with the compliment. Perhaps I may be, perhaps I may be, Mrs. Mann. He finished the gin and water, and added, "'Oliver, being now too old to remain here, the board have determined to have him back into the house. I have come out myself to take him there. So, let me see him at once.' "'I'll fetch him directly,' said Mrs. Mann, leaving the room for that purpose. Oliver, having had by this time, as much of the outer coat of dirt which encrusted his face and hands removed, as could be scrubbed off in one washing, was led into the room by his benevolent protectress. "'Make a bow to the gentleman, Oliver,' said Mrs. Mann. Oliver made a bow, which was divided between the beadle on the chair and the cocked hat on the table. "'Will you go along with me, Oliver?' said Mr. Bumble in a majestic voice. Oliver was about to say that he would go along with anybody with great readiness, when, glancing upward, he caught sight of Mrs. Mann, who had got behind the beadle's chair, and was shaking her fist at him with a furious countenance. He took the hint at once, for the fist had been too often impressed upon his body, not to be deeply impressed upon his recollection. "'Will she go with me?' inquired poor Oliver. "'No, she can't.' replied Mr. Bumble, but you'll come and see you sometimes." This was no very great consolation to the child. Young as he was, however, he had sense enough to make a feint of feeling great regret at going away. It was no very difficult matter for the boy to call tears into his eyes. Hunger and recent ill-usage are great assistants if you want to cry, and Oliver cried very naturally indeed. Mrs. Mann gave him a thousand embraces and what Oliver wanted a great deal more, a piece of bread and butter, lest he should seem too hungry when he got to the workhouse. With the slice of bread and butter in his hand, and the little brown cloth parish cap on his head, Oliver was then led away by Mr. Bumble from the wretched home where one kind word or look had never lighted the gloom of his infant years. <laughs> 
and yet he burst into an agony of childish grief, as the cottage gate closed after him. Wretched as were the little companions in misery he was leaving behind, they were the only friends he had ever known, and a sense of his loneliness in the great wide world sank into the child's heart for the first time. Mr. Bumble walked on with long strides. Little Oliver, firmly grasping his gold-laced cuff, trotted beside him, inquiring at the end of every quarter of a mile whether they were nearly there. To these interrogations, Mr. Bumble returned very brief and snappish replies. For the temporary blandness which gin and water awakens in some bosoms had by this time evaporated, and he was once again a beadle. Oliver had not been within the walls of the workhouse a quarter of an hour, and had scarcely completed the demolition of a second slice of bread, when Mr. Bumble, who had handed him over to the care of an old woman, returned, and, telling him it was board night, informed him that the board had said he was to appear before it forthwith. Not having a very clearly defined notion of what a live board was, Oliver was rather astounded by this intelligence, and was not quite certain whether he ought to laugh or cry. He had no time to think about the matter, however, for Mr. Bumble gave him a tap on the head with his cane to wake him up, and another on the back to make him lively, and bidding him to follow, conducted him into a large whitewashed room, where eight or ten fat gentlemen were sitting round a table. At the top of the table, seated in an armchair rather higher than the rest, was a particularly fat gentleman with a very round red face. "'Bow to the board,' said Bumble. Oliver brushed away two or three tears that were lingering in his eyes, and seeing no board but the table, fortunately bowed to that. "'What's your name, boy?' said the gentleman in the high chair. Oliver was frightened at the sight of so many gentlemen, which made him tremble, and the beadle gave him another tap behind, which made him cry. These two causes made him answer in a very low and hesitating voice, whereupon a gentleman in a white waistcoat said he was a fool, which was a capital way of raising his spirits and putting him quite at his ease. A boy, said the gentleman in the high chair, listen to me. You know you're an orphan, I suppose? "'What's that, sir?' inquired poor Oliver. "'The boy is a fool. I thought he was,' said the gentleman in the white waistcoat. "'Hush!' said the gentleman who had spoken first. "'You know you've got no father or mother, and that you were brought up by the parish, don't you?' "'Yes, sir,' replied Oliver, weeping bitterly. "'What are you crying for?' inquired the gentleman in the white waistcoat and to be sure it was very extraordinary. What could the boy be crying for? "'I hope you say your prayers every night,' said another gentleman in a gruff voice, "'and pray for the people who feed you and take care of you like a Christian.' "'Yes, sir,' stammered the boy. The gentleman who spoke last was unconsciously right. It would have been very like a Christian, and a marvellously good Christian, too if Oliver had prayed for the people who fed and took care of him. But he hadn't, because nobody had taught him. "'Well, you have come here to be educated and taught a useful trade,' said the red-faced gentleman in the high chair. "'So you'll begin to pick oakum tomorrow morning at six o'clock,' added the surly one in the white waistcoat. For the combination of both these blessings in the one simple process of picking oakum, Oliver bowed low, by the direction of the beadle, and was then hurried away to a large ward, where, on a rough, hard bed, he sobbed himself to sleep. What a novel illustration of the tender laws of England! They let the paupers go to sleep. Poor Oliver! He little thought, as he lay sleeping in happy unconsciousness of all around him, that the board had that very day arrived at a decision which would exercise the most material influence over all his future fortunes. But they had. And this was it. The members of this board were very sage, deep, philosophical men, and when they came to turn their attention to the workhouse, they found out at once, what ordinary folks would never have discovered, the poor people liked it. It was a regular place of public entertainment for the poorer classes. A tavern where there was nothing to pay, a public breakfast 
dinner, tea, and supper all the year round. A brick-and-mortar Elysium, where it was all play and no work. Oh, said the board, looking very knowing. We are the fellows to set this to rights. We'll stop it all in no time. So they established the rule that all poor people should have the alternative, for they would compel nobody, not they, of being starved by a gradual process in the house, or by a quick one out of it. With this view, they contracted with the waterworks to lay on an unlimited supply of water and with a corn factor to supply periodically small quantities of oatmeal, and issued three meals of thin gruel a day, with an onion twice a week, and half a roll of Sundays. They made a great many other wise and humane regulations, having reference to the ladies, which it is not necessary to repeat. Kindly undertook to divorce poor married people, in consequence of the great expense of a suit in Doctor's Commons, and instead of compelling a man to support his family, as they had theretofore done, took his family away from him, and made him a bachelor. There is no saying how many applicants for relief, under these last two heads, might have started up in all classes of society, if it had not been coupled with the workhouse. But the board were long-headed men, and had provided for this difficulty. The relief was inseparable from the workhouse and the gruel, and that frightened people. For the first six months after Oliver Twist was removed, the system was in full operation. It was rather expensive at first, in consequence of the increase in the undertaker's bill, and the necessity of taking in the clothes of all the paupers which fluttered loosely on their wasted, shrunken forms after a week or two's gruel. But the number of workhouse inmates got thin as well as the paupers, and the board were in ecstasies. The room in which the boys were fed was a large stone hall, with a copper at one end, out of which the master, dressed in an apron for the purpose, and assisted by one or two women, ladled the gruel at meal-times. Of this festive composition, each boy had one porringer, and no more, except on occasions of great public rejoicing, when he had two ounces and a quarter of bread besides. The bowls never wanted washing. The boys polished them with their spoons till they shone again, and when they had performed this operation, which never took very long, the spoons being nearly as large as the bowls, they would sit staring at the copper, with such eager eyes, as if they could have devoured the very bricks of which it was composed, employing themselves, meanwhile, in sucking their fingers most assiduously, with the view of catching up any stray splashes of gruel that might have been cast thereon. Boys have generally excellent appetites. Oliver Twist and his companions suffered the tortures of slow starvation for three months. At last they got so voracious and wild with hunger, that one boy, who was tall for his age, and hadn't been used to that sort of thing, for his father had kept a small cook-shop, hinted darkly to his companions, that unless he had another basin of gruel per diem, he was afraid he might some night happen to eat the boy who slept next to him who happened to be a weakly youth of tender age. He had a wild, hungry eye, and they implicitly believed him. A council was held. Lots were cast. Who should walk up to the master after supper that evening, and ask for more? And it fell to Oliver Twist. The evening arrived. Boys took their places. The master, in his cook's uniform, stationed himself at the copper. His pauper assistants ranged themselves behind him. The gruel was served out, and a long grace was said over the short commons. The gruel disappeared. The boys whispered each other, and winked at Oliver, while his next neighbours nudged him. Child as he was, he was desperate with hunger, and reckless with misery. He rose from the table, and advancing to the master, basin and spoon in hand, said, somewhat alarmed at his own temerity, "'Please, sir?' I want some more." The master was a fat, healthy man, but he turned very pale. He gazed in stupefied astonishment on the small rebel for some seconds, and then clung for support to the copper. The assistants were paralysed with wonder, the boys with fear. "'What?' 
said the master at length, in a faint voice. "'Please, sir,' replied Oliver, "'I want some more.' The master aimed a blow at Oliver's head with the ladle, pinioned him in his arm, and shrieked aloud for the beadle. The board was sitting in solemn conclave, when Mr. Bumble rushed into the room in great excitement, and addressing the gentleman in the high chair, said, "'Mr. Lemkins, I beg your pardon, sir. Oliver Twist has asked for more.' There was a general start. Horror was depicted on every countenance. "'For more?' said Mr. Limkins. "'Compose yourself, Bumble, and answer me distinctly. Do I understand that he asked for more, after he had eaten the supper allotted by the dietary?' "'He did, sir,' replied Bumble. "'That boy will be hung,' said the gentleman in the white waistcoat. "'I know that boy will be hung.' Nobody controverted the prophetic gentleman's opinion. An animated discussion took place. Oliver was ordered into instant confinement, and a bill was next morning pasted on the outside of the gate, offering a reward of five pounds to anybody who would take Oliver Twist off the hands of the parish. In other words, five pounds and Oliver Twist were offered to any man or woman who wanted an apprentice to any trade, business, or calling. "'I never was more convinced of anything in my life,' said the gentleman in the white waistcoat, as he knocked at the gate, and read the bill next morning. "'I never was more convinced of anything in my life than I am that that boy will come to be hung.' As I purpose to show in the sequel whether the white waistcoated gentleman was right or not, I should perhaps mar the interest of this narrative, supposing it to possess any at all, if I ventured to hint just yet, whether the life of Oliver Twist had this violent termination or no. End of chapter 2